my comments and questions are not at odds with legislative efforts to decrease elective abortions. Rather, they are based on the concern that this particular bill could compound the suffering of individuals who are going through the worst moments a mother can experience and penalize the medical professionals trained to alleviate such trauma. Protecting life clearly is a paramount responsibility. It has been a common thread in our debates about health care, education, the environment, criminal justice, economic opportunity, and more. And despite all the laws and regulations approved over the years, even taking into account the significant decline in the number of abortions, many Pennsylvanians still believe there are too many being performed. So it is certainly legitimate for us to re-examine state laws regulating abortion. One of the greatest marvels of medical science is how we have increased survivability of premature births. There are many individuals living among us who have had, they been born a generation or two earlier, would have had no hope for a long life. For that, we are truly blessed as a society. So for those of us questioning what is being attempted here today, it is not to say that we do not value life or that we've stopped trying to protect life. However, the difficulty in securing change reasonably goes beyond the improbable challenge of bridging the divide between the two sides of this discussion. Many opposed to abortion in all circumstances do so out of deeply held religious and moral beliefs. I understand and respect those individuals. But if we concede that there are exceptions to an absolute ban, then the current concern about practice does matter. Should it be dictated legislatively? Once we start substituting legislative judgment for medical judgment, where will it stop? The hard truth is that medical science is unable to predict or detect the variety of genetic abnormalities on a schedule. So my questions, has everyone taken the time to look at the list of lethal defects that are not detectable or diagnosable until 18 to 20 weeks after gestation? Has everyone taken the time to talk to a physician who's had to deliver terrible news? Has everyone taken the time to talk to a mother who has received this devastating news? And are we going to take into account the impossible choices these individuals confront. My argument today is not one simply of political or personal philosophy. Rather, it comes from a deeply painful experience. As the mother of a son, my appreciation for the value and wonder of life is incomparable. As the mother of a child, who was diagnosed with a rare genetic condition well after the 20-week threshold, my understanding of the intense pain and sorrow involved has not subsided or diminished in 21 years. Nothing, nothing prepares a family, a father, or a mother to hear the words your baby's diagnosis is incompatible with life. For me, early testing offered hope, but that was dashed in an instant when we received the results of extensive diagnostic exams and an amniocentesis. For weeks, weeks, I rode the roller coaster of receiving good and bad news from numerous doctors and specialists tests that were conducted 
over a seven week period. At first, I was assured my baby was fine, that I was going to be the mother of another son. The previous result simply was a false positive, nothing to worry about. My husband and I opted for further tests to be certain. In the meantime, everything appeared to be normal. My pregnancy was progressing. Then we received the call that completely changed our lives. The specialist in Philadelphia said the results were in and we needed to be in his office by 9 a.m. the next morning. We had to travel two hours knowing something had gone terribly wrong. The news was devastating. The son we thought would join our family was in fact a daughter, one who had a very rare chromosome abnormality, a diagnosis that even the doctor had no experience with. He said there was a one in 125,000 chance of having this result detected in an amniocentesis test. Needless to say, I couldn't catch my breath. This couldn't be happening to my family. My husband and I were in shock and disbelief. He said, go home, talk to your doctor, talk to your family, talk to your minister. Follow-up visits confirmed, in my case, that I was already in premature labor. Our daughter, whom we named Allison, was delivered stillborn at the hospital a short time later. I was planning for a nursery, never expecting to plan a funeral. So yes, my life was forever changed by this experience. My son never got to be the big brother he wished for. My husband and I never had more children. And my father suffered an aneurysm the day after my daughter's funeral and died two weeks later. My mother always believed it was from a broken heart for our loss. So there, but for the grace of God, go I. I can't help but think of the women who received this same devastating news. This is not a matter to be decided based on misperception, efforts to legislate and criminalize the practice of medicine set a dangerous precedent. The concerns of hundreds of obstetricians and gynecologists should matter, and it's hard to discount their worry and concern for their patients. So once we get into the substitution of legislative preference for medical judgment, there will be many other areas to make a statement and inflexible. Do we really want to convict a doctor of third-degree felony punishable by possibly seven years in jail for maybe offering medically appropriate care? So my question is, why are we moving something so consequential so quickly without a public hearing? During the past two-year session, I chaired several hearings on subjects of great emotion, where views were intensely divided. Each side was given their opportunity to make their case. Members could ask questions. The parties could respond. It's indeed what I believe deliberative bodies do when they're seriously in search of an equitable and balanced solution. Why is this issue not being given the same treatment? If this bill cannot stand or withstand an open round of debate involving the medical community and ethicists, what do we really have here? Is it possible to go too far in law and sanction to where we cost lives when we're really intending to save them? The motivation behind this proposal is very well intended. But for me, the implications and the consequences are not. I simply cannot support this 
in conscience. Thank you.